The second Victorian Campaign Medal for South Africa was issued to British Army and local militia units for service in a series of tribal wars in the Cape of Good Hope, Colony of Natal and the Transvaal between 1877 and 1879. That said, it is mainly known as the medal awarded to the men who took part in the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879, immortalised in the 1964 film Zulu, starring Jack Hawkins and Michael Caine. It is unofficially referred to as the Zulu War Medal. The first conflict covered by this period, known as the Geika Galeka War, was sparked by an attack by those two tribes on the Fingos, a smaller tribe under the protection of the Crown. Lieutenant General Sir Arthur Cunningham, Governor of the Colony, was dispatched to punish the attack with a small force including a naval brigade. The war lasted a year and was the final blow for the last independent coast estate, Galakaland, which was now being administered as a British territory. Several other similar mini-conflicts followed during the three-year period, many of which only involved local militia in minor clashes but in 1878 the foundations for the war after which this medal was unofficially named were laid when, in an attempt to unite the whole of South Africa under British rule, South African High Commissioner Sir Bartle Frere sent a deliberately provocative, untenable ultimatum to the Zulu King, Chechweo, on the 11th of December. His actions were specifically designed to provoke the Zulus into a war. Upon its inevitable rejection, Frere ordered his friend, Major General Lord Chelmsford, to invade the Zulu Kingdom. Both men were acting on their own initiative and without government sanction. On the 11th of January 1879, Chelmsford led a 12,000 strong army, divided into three columns into Zululand. He crossed the Buffalo River at a ford named Rourke's Drift. Near the crossing was a mission station of the Church of Sweden, former trading post of James Rourke, a merchant from the Eastern Cape. A small force of the 2nd Battalion, the 24th Regiment of Foot, under Major Henry Spaulding, was detailed to garrison the post, which had been turned into a supply depot and hospital. On the 20th of January, Chelmsford Colon marched to Isandwana, approximately 15 kilometres to the east, and pitched camp. In what can only be described as a catastrophic blunder, Chelmsford severely underestimated the Zulu's capabilities and did not form any type of defensive position. Scouts were sent ahead and a skirmish took place with what was thought to be the vanguard of the Zulu army. Two days later, Chelmsford, taking about 2,800 soldiers, departed the camp to try and find the main Zulu force with the intention of bringing them to battle. He left the remaining men of Number 3 column to guard the camp, exposed and virtually defenceless. Chelmsford left behind approximately 750 men of the 24th Regiment of Foot to guard the camp, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Henry Pauline. Pauline also had around 700 men, composed of the Natal native contingent, local mounted irregulars and other units. He also had two artillery pieces, with around 70 men from the Royal Artillery. A total of over 1,800 men and two artillery guns were left to defend the camp. By splitting his forces in the field, Chelmsford had made a second basic military blunder, and while he was in the field seeking them, the entire Zulu army had outmaneuvered him, moving behind his force with the intention of attacking the British army camped at Isandwana. The Zulu army, about 20,000 men, gathered near the camp undiscovered, until about 11am, when a scouting party stumbled on them concealed in a valley. Having been discovered, the Zulu force leapt to the offensive. The scouts began a fighting retreat to the camp and a messenger was sent to warn Pauline. The Zulu attack then developed into a pitch battle with the aim of encircling the British position. Pauline sent out first one, then all six companies of the 24th foot into an extended firing line with the aim of meeting the Zulu attack head on and checking it with its firepower. For an hour or so, the disciplined British volleys pinned down the Zulu centre, inflicting many casualties and causing the advance to stall. Morale remained high within the British line, sensing a possible victory. Nevertheless, the left wing of the Zulu advance was moving, unseen, to outflank and envelop the British right. The troops on the British right, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Durnford, a veteran of the Kosa Wars, had been fighting the longest, and began to withdraw as their ammunition ran low. 
Durnford's withdrawal exposed the right flank of the British regulars, which, with the general threat of the Zulu encirclement, caused Pauline to order a withdrawal. The regulars' retreat was performed with order and discipline, and the men of the 24th conducted a fighting withdrawal into the camp, but it was hopeless. The diminishing number of British troops, despite far superior firepower, was no match for the overwhelming number of Zulu warriors, and while a small number of the British contingent managed to escape, the defenceless camp was soon overrun. The British fought back to back with bayonet and rifle butt when their ammunition ran out, but they finally fell to spear and club. A later search of the battlefield found the presence of a large number of bodies grouped together, suggesting the resistance was protracted and a number of desperate last stands were made. Evidence shows that many of the bodies were found in several large groups around the camp, including one last stand of around 150 men. Of the 1,800 force of British troops and African auxiliaries, over 1,300 were killed, most of them Europeans, including field commanders Pauline and Durnford. It is impossible to know the Zulu losses, but it is generally estimated to be between 1,500 and 2,000 men killed, with the possibility of thousands more being wounded. The British lost some 1,000 rifles, two field artillery guns, 400,000 rounds of ammunition and three colours. While the bulk of the Zulu army was attacking the doomed column at Isandwana, a small portion of the Zulu reserve broke off and advanced the 15 kilometres back to the Buffalo River and the outpost at Rourke's Drift. The garrison, now under the command of Lieutenant John Chard, Spalding having left to look for an overdue relief column, was ignorant of the battle till about 3pm when Lieutenant Gert Adendorf of the native Natal contingent arrived bearing the news of the defeat and that part of the Zulu army was approaching the station. Chard, a lieutenant of the Royal Engineers, consulted with Gonville Bromhead, a lieutenant from the 24th Regiment, but junior to Chard, and decided that the only course of action was to stay and defend the garrison. Chard and Bromhead directed their men to make preparations to defend the station, and a defensive perimeter was quickly constructed out of mealy bags. This perimeter incorporated the storehouse, the hospital and a stone corral. The buildings were fortified with loopholes knocked through the external walls and external doors barricaded with furniture. The Zulu, numbering around 4,000, arrived at the waiting garrison at around 4.30. The defenders numbered some 150 men, some of them in hospital sick or injured. The heroic defence of Rourke's Drift is a well-known and documented story of stoic British military discipline and tactics that is told in books and film and well beyond the scope of this video to do it justice. Suffice to say that the defenders endured 12 hours of nearly constant but piecemeal attacks from a vastly greater force of courageous but lightly armed Zulu warriors. At the break of day on the 23rd of January, the survivors were relieved to find that the Zulu had withdrawn they were exhausted by the previous day's advance and badly hurt by the drift's solid defence. Some 350 dead warriors were counted around the site and an estimated another 500 were wounded. Inside the camp, 17 defenders were dead and another 15 badly wounded. Almost every man had some kind of wound. The British government needed a good news story to counter the disaster at Isandwanda and Rourke's drift was perfect. Eleven Victoria Crosses were awarded to the defenders, seven of them to soldiers of the 24th foot, the most ever received for a single action by one regiment. Four Distinguished Conduct Medals were also awarded. Following the battle and siege, Chelmsford had little choice but to withdraw from Zululand, but it didn't end there. With British prestige severely dented and the desire to avenge it by winning the war, London now authorised a second invasion this time under Sir Garnet Wolsey, who was sent to replace Chelmsford. But before he could arrive, Chelmsford, again somewhat without orders, avoided handing over command to Wolsey and managed to defeat the Zulus in a number of engagements, the last of which was the Battle of Ulundi on the 4th of July 1879, in which, after half an hour of concentrated fire from artillery, the then new Gatling gun and thousands of British riflemen the Zulu military power was finally broken. Chelmsford then ordered the Royal Corral of Ulundi to be burnt. Chelmsford finally turned over command to Wolseley on the 15th of July, leaving for home on the 17th. He had partly salvaged his reputation, largely because of Ulundi, 
However, he was severely criticised by a horse guard's investigation and would never again serve in the field. The medal for events in South Africa from 1877 to 1879 was sanctioned by Army Order No. 103 of August 1880, but it seems to have created some confusion. It was to be a new version of the South Africa Medal of 1853, covered in No. 8 of this series, but no mention of a change in design was contained within the order. This missing information means that the obverse of the South Africa Medal of 1879 is identical to the earlier medal, which is all well and good, except that the young queen design was well out of date by now, Victoria now being over 60 years old. This design had not been used for medals for nearly 20 years, the last one being the second China. It also means that the Latin inscription Victoria Regina, Victoria the Queen, strips her of her title of Empress, earned in 1876, and it is the last time this design was used on Victorian campaign medals. The reverse of the 1879 South Africa medal is again taken from its earlier counterpart and features a crouching lion on a plinth in front of a protea bush with a single flower. The medal is inscribed South Africa around the top perimeter. The only difference is the removal of the date 1853 in the exerg. It is replaced with a military trophy consisting of a Zulu ox hide shield and four crossed assengais. The medal disc was struck in silver and it is 36 millimetres in diameter. It is suspended from its ribbon by an ornamental silver swivelling suspender. The ribbon is gold with thick dark blue stripes towards the edges and two thinner dark blue stripes towards the centre. The number, rank, name and regiment of the recipient is engraved on the edge of the medal in capital letters. Seven clasps were authorised, all of them denoting the years in which the recipient served. The first for 1877 is relatively rare as the award started for service in September 1877 so anyone awarded this bar only served during the last four months of that one year. 153 of these were awarded. The second was for 1877-78. Some 5,800 clasps were awarded. The third was for 1877, 78 and 79, awarded to recipients who had qualifying service in all three years. Over 3,500 of these clasps were eventually issued. The fourth, for 1877-9, was awarded to recipients who had qualifying service in 77 and 79, but no service in 78. By far the scarcest clasp awarded for this medal, and one of the rarest of any Victorian campaign medal, it is highly sought after by medal collectors. Numbers are uncertain, but certainly less than 30 were ever awarded. The fifth was for service only in 1878, just over 2,000 of these clasps were awarded, and the sixth was for service in 1878 and 79. 1,185 of these clasps were eventually awarded. And the last was for service only in 1879, by far the most numerous given that reinforcements had arrived to enable the second invasion of Zululand and the Battle of Ulundi. Over 18,000 of these clasps were eventually issued. The medal could be issued without a clasp to members of the military who had been mobilised in Natal but had not crossed into Zululand, and to sailors who served on Royal Naval warships and transports in support operations off the coast. 5,610 no-class medals were awarded, one of which is this one, awarded to Charles Harris, a plumber's mate aboard HMS Euphrates, an iron-hulled troopship. Harris, who joined the Navy in 1875, went on to serve 30 years on 12 different ships, his conduct being described as very good. Thank you for watching and join me again next time when we look at medals awarded to Victorian soldiers who fought in the world's favourite battleground, Afghanistan.